just minutes ago, Oklahoma's U.S. Senator James Langford releasing his newest edition of Federal Fumbles. It is the sixth government waste report Senator Langford has put together since taking office in 2015. And Senator Langford joins me now live in studio to discuss. Senator, good morning to you. Oh, good morning to you as well. Great good to, to see you again. Good to see you here yeah. in studio. So um, before we get into some of the specific fumbles here, let's talk about your overall takeaway here from the report when it comes to government spending. Yeah, so we tried to do a big picture on this. Uh, government spending is accelerated uh, for the past several decades. Uh, and if I go back to 10 years ago, people used to say to me, when do we go over the top? When, when is it too hard to be able to recover anymore? Can we get on top of it from there? And I smile at them and say, that was actually about 25 years ago. Uh, when you go back 25 years ago, we were at $5 trillion in debt. And then it was $10 trillion, and then it's 15. Now it's $30 trillion in debt. It's accelerated. So you think about 25 years ago from uh, what was Andrew Jackson was the last time we had no debt at all up to about 25 years ago, we'd accumulated $5 trillion in total debt. Just from that time 25 years ago to now, it's now accelerated another $25 trillion on top of that. So the numbers are really large and it's hard to be able to wrap your head around it. So what I try to do in the federal fumbles is say, spending is accelerating, few people are talking about it anymore. There are areas of waste that we need to be able to get on top of, but we've got to have a growing economy and we've got to be able to structure our spending and to be able to do things wisely. And right now we're not, and during the time of COVID, we all knew there was gonna be a lot more spending during that time period to be able to get through it. But now we're on the other side of that. We've got to get this under control again. In your opinion, where does the fault lie? Is this with any specific administration, no, no. a number of administrations, with you and your colleagues in Congress? It, Do you take a little it, bit of blame there? It, it's, it's everything. It's okay. all the above on it. Uh, so it is no specific administration. This is not a Democrat-Republican problem. This is a national problem, uh, and it is a Congress problem, and it and it's just accelerating. So now we are where we are. We've got to be able to deal with this. Last year, we spent $567 billion just in interest payments on our debt half a trillion dollars just in interest payments. It's hard to be able to wrap your head around numbers that are that big. And so I'm always trying to be able to help people understand this is not just a big number, it's a really big number. This is not a mortgage that we're paying off. This is a giant jumbo mortgage that we're paying off. And uh, just to be able to process this, the amount of debt that we have, if dollars were seconds, it would take a million years, a million years to be able to do this amount of debt. Uh, so it is it is an enormous amount of money. So you highlighted your top 10 fumbles here All in this right. report. Out of those top 10, are there any that stick out specifically? Uh, there, there, there's, there's some big ones and there's lots and lots of small ones. We did kind of a March Madness kind of theme. I know it's a football theme uh, book that we do every year, but we did kind of a March Madness where we put online and put a bunch of different options out there. And number one ended up the $2 billion that was spent not building the border fence last year. Uh, when President Biden put a pause and said, we're not gonna do any border fencing uh, his first day in office, the contracts were already out. So we literally spent $2 billion paying the contractors to not do construction. That's a pretty big fault. And that's a lot of waste that was out there as well. But there's lots of small ones. We, we, we uh, last year, all the earmarks came back last year. Much to my frustration, much to my push against all this. So everybody said, well, the earmarks are earmarks. They're no big deal on it. Well, it's a swimming pool uh, up in uh, Rhode Island uh, that now is being refurbished. It's a ski jump in New Hampshire uh, that's at a state park there. Uh, there's bike trails that are being added into Vermont that are in a state park. Again, I, I don't have anything against ski jumps, bike trails, and swimming pools. The question is, should the federal taxpayer be paying for those things in those state and city parks? And my answer is no. States and cities need to pay for that. We have trillions and dollars of debt. We've got to be able to pay attention to these things and to not have federal dollars going into additional debt while we're not dealing with those local issues. Going back to COVID, one thing you, you said here, after two years of overspending on COVID, it is time now more than ever to look at how the government has dropped the ball and pushed for real solutions to recover before more damage is done. How, in your view, could we have better spent that money on COVID? Yeah, so COVID spending was this initially, it was trying to save the entire economy and quite frankly, the entire world. Uh, when the economy shuts down here in the United States and it did all over the country, we lose track of the fact 25% of the world's economy, the world's economy is in the United States. If the United States catches a cold, the whole world catches pneumonia, if you, if you can do it economically that way. So the whole world is very dependent on the United States actually functioning. If we don't get through COVID and if our businesses don't stay intact, like what we did with the Paycheck Protection Program, like we did some other small business things, we've got to be able to get through it. Now we are on the other side of it. We've got to pay off that debt. Uh, we did six and a half trillion dollars in additional spending on COVID during that time period that's got to be paid off. Now, some of it I, I was pretty public. I didn't like and didn't vote for. Uh, many of them I did. 
Uh, but the last one that was done in March of last year on it was an additional $2 trillion after we were already on the backside of COVID. Our economy was recovering. I didn't feel like that one was necessary. In fact, I think that's what spiked our economy uh, during this time period and our inflation rates so quickly. Uh, other countries didn't experience inflation like we have in the United States, but they didn't do a giant spending bill right at the end of COVID. So I think that was a mistake. There are some things that just had to be done. It was the ultimate rainy day. Uh, that we've got to be able to get through. A couple more things I want to touch on because we only have a few minutes left here. Can you tell us more about this documentary you're involved with on Apple TV Plus and what that's all about? It is. This is, a, this is one of those areas I've focused on a long time about Medicare and Social Security and some of the waste and fraud that's in those programs in this. Social Security was one of those that for a very long time we've been fighting against the fraud areas where you've got a situation like what happened in West Virginia where an attorney, his name was Eric Kahn, uh, the craziest name for an attorney in this kind of story. Quite you could, appropriate. You can't make this stuff up. Yeah. Who is literally paying off a judge to be able to write paperwork for Social Security recipients that if they don't get disability payments, they go to a certain attorney, he pays off a certain judge, and then it actually, they get into Social Security. So a typical, if you get Social Security disability request and go through an attorney, uh, you'll get a certain amount that will actually go through that. Now, the attorneys get a significant amount of the money from that Social Security recipient. That's another area I'm trying to be able to work through. But we helped expose that. This actually started with Dr. Tom Coburn when he was in the Senate, worked very hard on an initial report. We finished this out and worked with the Inspector General, got it done, got him prosecuted. But it's one of those you can't make this up kind of stories that we exposed. And it is millions and millions of dollars in the Social Security Trust Fund uh, that was actually stolen from the American taxpayer that we can't get back. But it's a lesson of how government can just turn its head and not pay attention. Mm -hmm. And the federal taxpayer, in this case, Social Security recipients, are the ones that get hurt. We'll look for that on Apple TV+. Plus. I want to ask you, you're heading back to Washington literally in like a couple of couple hours, hours. Just stopping here to, before you fly back. What's the latest on Title 42? It seems like there's a big fight brewing in Congress over there this. There is a big fight brewing on this. Title 42 is a pandemic response. It covers lots of areas like telemedicine. There's lots of things that go into Title 42, but one of those things is also border security. President Trump put it in place and said, during this time period of the pandemic, we're not going to allow people to be able to cross the border, even if they're requesting asylum and other things. We've got to stop. The Biden administration lifted half of that when they first came in the office. They now want to lift, lift the rest of it. The problem is with that, Title 42 was always going to be temporary. Uh, but they want to lift that Title 42 on the border, but still keep it on members of the military. Well, they're literally still firing members of the military if they don't get a COVID shot. They're still doing all the telemedicine things. They're still doing all the other areas of Title 42, but they're saying it's over at the border. And it gets even sillier. They're saying they're going to allow everyone to be able to cross the border now, but they can't be held in ICE facilities because there's COVID still. Uh, so they're literally allowing them over the border and then just releasing them in the country. I've been fighting this for months from them to say you can't lift part of Title 42 just at the border and not other areas. Now I've had five Democrat senators that have also joined me in this and said to the Biden administration, you can't do this. So we're actively pushing back on this area. I've got lots of issues at the border and how the Biden administration's handled the border. But this has been the craziest one of all of them to go. You, you can't just allow more people. The Biden administration themselves believes when they lift Title 42, a million people will illegally cross the border in the first six weeks when they do this. We cannot do that as a nation, should not do that as a nation. Only a few seconds left here. I want to ask you about uh, Coach Kennedy, the uh, yeah. football coach in Washington State, lost his job uh, after praying on the field after games. Right. Uh, parents say that there should be a separation of church and state here. He's a state employee, shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. What are your thoughts on all so that? So th this is a great case. It's in the Supreme Court today, actually, in oral arguments. I've kept up with Coach Kennedy for the last several years. He was not leading students in prayer. He was actually, after the football game was over, he would kneel and pray and thank God for protecting his players. That was it. So what I push back on is this would prevent a teacher at school from bowing her head and praying over her meal at her school. This would prevent a teacher at school from wearing a crucifix around her neck. All those things are protected speech. A football coach at the end of the game praying by themselves. Now, other at times, other students came in and joined in. It was all voluntary. But this is literally a coach that kneels at the end of the game. And what I've said to folks is it's protected speech for you to be able to kneel during the national anthem. It should also be protected speech for an individual to be able to kneel and pray. Both those are protected speech items and need to be guarded in our in our nation. Even if some kids felt like they were forced, because you had I watched some of the stories this morning. Some yeah. parents felt like their kids were being forced to yeah. go, to sit there and pray. It with was them. always an, it was always an open invitation. They could, but it was always voluntary. Quite frankly, that's true in football fields all over our state every single week uh, during football season, where people will go out voluntarily pray before the game or after the game, whatever it is. It has a lot of significance. It's what is the rights of an individual 
to be able to live your own faith principles. Uh, whether it be you wear a hijab, uh, and is that protected, or is that a demonstration of faith, or where it is you're kneeling after a football game to be able to silently pray. Uh, all those things are protected speech. We have a great thing called the First Amendment that protects the rights of individuals to pray. That coach cannot compel students to be able to join him in his religious exercise, but he also still has the right to live his own faith. All right, Senator Langford, I know you got to catch a flight. We appreciate you joining us. Great to us. be able to see you again. Thank you so much.